Did you know this year that between five and seven million people will die earlier than they should have because of pollution in the air? And air pollution is not a new idea. It's impacted our world largely since the widespread use of coal began during the Industrial Revolution. And the cause today remains the same, the combustion of fossil fuels in our energy systems. And during combustion, various chemical and particle species are generated, we call them pollutants, and then released to the atmosphere in the form of emissions, pollutant emissions. Once they're there, they're subjected to a host of very complicated processes. They change chemically into other pollutants. A good example of this is ozone, which doesn't come from a car tailpipe or a power plant stack, but forms in the atmosphere during reactions between other pollutants in the presence of sunlight. They're moved around and mixed by things like wind and weather, and the final outcome is what we think of as air pollution. And I think we all understand that air pollution has detrimental impacts on our society, most importantly on human health. But it also degrades our materials and it harms our ecosystem. So the question that I'm interested in is how can we design clean air strategies in tandem with satisfactory societal energy availability? That is, how can we achieve a future with clean air while continuing to ensure reliable supplies of energy for things like transportation, electricity generation, industry, and the like? Air pollution causes tremendous harm, but so too with the inability to provide the electricity needed to keep hospitals operating, or our ability to produce and distribute clean water and food. Now there's an important point here. I said, how can we, not can we? I know that we can. Technologies available today and those that will become available in the future will allow us to convert the energy we need in the absence of pollutant emissions. Most importantly amongst these are renewable resources, which will allow us to generate electricity and other fuels from resources like wind and solar radiation, biomass feedstocks, and others. In tandem with that, we can deploy highly efficient zero emitting technologies in our end use energy sectors. Electrification is a good example of this. We can convert our technologies to run on electricity and then provide that from renewables, say an electric car that's charged with wind and solar power. And you can imagine a strategy like that would have many benefits to society, not just to clean air. But we have to understand that this conversion from fossil energy systems to renewable is an unprecedented event in our history, one that comes with significant challenges and uncertainties. So what does this have to do with our clean air strategies? Well, historic changes in the sources of emissions necessitate historic changes in the scope and scale of our clean air strategies. See, historically, they were designed to limit emissions from fossil sources. So, for example, in California in the early part of the 19th century, motor vehicle exhaust was a major problem. Our skies were literally choked with smog. So we invented technologies to reduce emissions from cars like the catalytic converter. We just stuck it on the tailpipe. But we didn't stop using the internal combustion engine. We reformulated gasoline chemically so that when it's burned, it produces less pollution, but we didn't stop using gasoline. We're hitting limits now where that type of approach is not effective. It doesn't provide the deep reductions in emissions that we're gonna need to clean the air. So our clean air strategies have to be designed within this framework of transformation, accounting for these things. And I think there's two important reasons for that. The first is that the challenge we face in cleaning the air while ensuring we meet our energy needs is so great that we essentially have to do a great job. We can't even just do a good job. And the second is that with all of this uncertainty and change, we have to make sure that we're not problem shifting. That is cleaning the air somewhere at the expense of making it worse somewhere else. So the main idea that I want to present to you today is this. Our clean air strategies must comprehensively seek sustainability for all citizens. This is kind of a mouthful, so I'd like to take it a piece at a time. Comprehensive, complete, including all aspects. So as we pursue clean air through advanced technologies and fuels, we have to understand and address changes in emissions anywhere that they occur. You can imagine, as we start to use new technologies, new strategies, there'll be these effects within our energy systems that'll begin to spread out. Of course, the idea that comes to my mind is ripples on a pond, with each ripple being a place where emissions are now changing because of our clean air strategy. I think an example works best here. So let's take our electric car. Let's drop it into our energy systems pond. The first ripple is very straightforward. We've reduced emissions from on-road vehicles because we've taken an electric vehicle, which has none, and replaced a gasoline vehicle, which does. Good. The second ripple isn't as straightforward, though, because we need to generate more electricity now to charge our car, and that might increase emissions from our power plants. Even with increasing levels of renewables, some portion of our electricity is likely to come from fossil fuels in the foreseeable future. Understanding this ripple isn't as straightforward because essentially what we're doing is moving emissions in space and time. 
from a car tailpipe to a power plant stack. And better looking at situations like this speaks to the heart of my research. And to do this, we use computer models to account for both the reduced emissions from the cars and the increased emissions from the power plant stacks. That way, we can study how changing the emissions changes the atmospheric concentrations of the pollutants, air pollution. So let's look at a situation like this. Let's start with a baseline in the year 2030. Just like today, our baseline is composed mostly of gasoline vehicles. Now let's convert about 40% of those to electricity, and let's assume about 50% of our electricity is coming from renewables, with a lot from wind and solar. What I'm about to show you is the change in ozone air pollution from the baseline for this scenario. So where you see green and blue, the ozone concentration has decreased. The, the air pollution has gotten better. And you can see that's most of the state, right? Which makes sense. We have a lot of cars. And the darkest blue, which is the best improvement or the largest improvement, is occurring in important areas like urban regions, which have high populations. That means our change in air pollution could also have really important human health effects. Your eye is probably also drawn, though, to the areas of red and yellow on this figure. Those are locations where the power plant emissions have increased as they help meet this new demand for electricity, and it's worsened the ozone air pollution. Does that matter? It would matter to you if you live next to one of those power plants, and it brings up the even more important question of who deserves clean air. Most people? Of course not. Everyone deserves clean air. Everyone deserves to live and work and go to school and grow up in air that doesn't harm their health. This is the idea of environmental justice, and it's very important because historically, Air pollution hasn't been just. So our clean air strategies have to be designed so that they provide clean air to all citizens, irrespective of socioeconomic or any other factors. OK, let's go back to our scenario, and let's see what we can do about these power plant impacts. One thing we could do is to control when the cars are charged. What's happening here is we're all coming home from work or school at about the same time, and we're all plugging in our cars, just like we would. That's creating a large growth in demand for electricity at that time, in the afternoon and evening. In fact, it's so large that older, dirtier power plants that operate on natural gas have to turn on to help meet some of it. They're called load falling and peaker plants. The other issue here is that that doesn't match up well with when our renewable resources are available. So we can't control wind and solar power the way we can fossil power plants. The wind blows when it blows. The sun shines during the day. So what if we developed a controlled charging strategy and had people charge their cars more in the middle of the day when we had extra solar power available? That's what you see here. We've been able to reduce some of that worsening from the power plants because we're charging our cars with solar power and not natural gas. If you're particularly sharp-eyed, you may have also noticed that the green and the blue got a little bit fainter. That means our improvement from the vehicle exhaust reduction isn't as good either. That's because when we gave our models these constraints, there was just less electricity available for cars. So essentially what we're assuming here is only about 30% of the cars were able to operate on electricity. Now, certainly the long-term goal would be to charge as many electric cars as possible while still avoiding these power plant impacts. And we'll be able to do that with other technologies, like energy storage, which will allow us to shift renewable energy in time, and fuel cells, which can generate electricity in the absence of pollutant emissions. But the point that I'm making here is that a comprehensive clean air strategy involving electric cars would need to account for all of these factors, right? Electric cars and renewable electricity is a good clean air strategy. But electric cars and renewable electricity and advanced complementary strategies is a very good clean air strategy. And you can imagine these ripples just continuing to spread out. The next one might be in our gasoline production sector. I think it might surprise some of you to know that just making gasoline and moving it to the gas pump results in significant amounts of air pollution. Those large refinery complexes you see around the ports, if you're ever driving on the 405, right? Those are important sources of pollutant emissions. So if we need less gasoline, maybe we could reduce emissions from some of those refineries. On the other hand, maybe they'll just sell the finished gasoline in other states or other countries and stay on. So electric cars with renewable electricity, advanced complementary strategies, and policies requiring reductions from our refineries could be a great clean air strategy. OK, so we're done. We figured all this out. Not quite. Because I use the word sustainability here. Sustainability is the conditions that will allow human beings and the planet to thrive and support future generations. And clean air is just one part of that. It's an important part, but it's only one part. Avoiding changes in global climate by reducing greenhouse gas emissions is an essential part of sustainability. Preserving our natural ecosystems is an essential part. 
managing and preserving our freshwater resources is an essential part. And there are many others, right? And just like our energy system, these issues are deeply interconnected. As an example, the physical effects of climate change alone will worsen ozone air pollution by causing hotter, harsher summers. Ozone formation in the atmosphere is temperature dependent, right? That's why smog's a problem in summer. Just climate change will worsen air pollution, no emissions change. So our clean air strategies can't be designed just to target pollutant emission reductions. They have to be designed to achieve that and greenhouse gas reductions, and to preserve our ecosystems, and to reduce our water resource impacts, and on and on. And they have to do it while ensuring a good quality of life for our society, considering things like economics and mobility, right? Easy. Not easy. Really tough, actually. In fact, concluding today, I have to confess that every concept that I've proposed is exceptionally difficult to implement in the real world. We have to transform our energy systems. We have to transform our clean air strategies. We have to transform societal values and thinking. But that's where we're at. As a society, that's where we're at. We have to start confronting these problems, no matter how big, and finding solutions. And I can tell you right now that the solutions will not just come from people like me. I think it's easy to think, oh, this is something that scientists or engineers, maybe government regulators could work on. No, no, the problem's too big. The solutions are gonna have to come from every aspect of society, all of you. The solutions will have to come from educators who can teach our youth about these concepts. The solutions will have to come from social scientists who can better study human behavior and how to influence it towards sustainability. The solutions will need to come from artists and musicians, authors, poets, to, who can capture the beauty of the world and why, why it's worth preserving. So if you have a passion for energy, for the environment, or just for people, I would urge you to work with me on finding solutions to this problem, to design strategies to achieve a future with clean air. Thank you.